I'm Brad Power. I'm the host uh, with Rick and Brian of the Prostate Cancer Lab. And today uh, we're going to be going through sort of an update on some of the work we're doing every week. There's this approach in Agile they call a sprint. So every week we've got a sprint. We learn something. We, we've got new issues that we've got on the table we'd like your help with. And, uh, you know, this is building on top of the launch event that we had a week ago where Brian and Rick introduced their backgrounds and uh, their, their goals and a purpose for this prostate cancer lab. I hope you got the notes from that if you weren't able to join. Um, so just to set this up, um, I'm gonna share my screen and show you the, we call our poster, which is sort of our process model for what we're up to. And we'll use this today to uh, kind of go around, the, go around the circle here to update on the different aspects of the prostate cancer lab. And there, there's some things that are not even on here that uh, we'll need to to things, <laughs> things like um, uh, uh, a, uh, uh, like th th this effort as an initiative and whether we should get grants and that sort of thing. Um, any questions or comments on this uh, prostate cancer lab poster before I kind of open it up to Rick and Brian to start and go around the go around the wheel here. Is there a question why cancer is crossed out at MD Anderson? Is it, have they changed their name or something or? That's their logo. I think oh. that they, it's, it's intentionally oh, it's like symbolic. That's... You know, they, uh, they're trying Abolish to end cancer. Abolish cancer kind of? Yeah, they're, okay. it's, it's, okay. it's yeah. The, the logo, you'd have to ask their logo designers, but that's the real <laughs> deal. We didn't do that, they did that. <laughs> and the reason we have MD Anderson on here is because Sumit Sabuti, who's on the list there of the clinical reviewers, is there. And we rely on him to sort of keep us apprised of the stuff that's going on there because they're one of the leading uh, academic research centers. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so let's start with attracting patients. Um, we have, uh, I think, nine or 10 patients that have registered, advanced prostate cancer patients that have registered with us. And uh, Brian's done an outreach to them to see if they would like to participate in a, uh, uh, a focused meeting, uh, kind of like a focus group, to understand their needs and interests. Uh, Brian, do you want to speak to that? Um, you're on mute, mute Brian. Yes, it's much more effective when you can hear me. Um, so uh, yes, so I think we were maybe a little bit surprised uh, how many um, patients actually showed up at our kickoff last week, as well as those that have signed up since, which is encouraging. And when we saw the number of, of patients, I think there were about nine, uh, we thought it might be worthwhile to um, understand what their needs are and in particular with respect to our mission, which is to improve diagnostics and to um, increase the speed at which diagnostics are integrated into our clinical care. But we don't wanna stop there. We wanna understand um, a little bit more about the challenges that they face um, and, um, and see sort of like what comes from that, what themes emerge and how that can uh, round out what we're doing here with Prostate Cancer Lab. Anything else, Brian, on attract patients? I know uh, you, you were talking to some of uh, Rick Davis's uh, people at ANCAN about uh, you know getting them involved. Ben's, Ben's among those people, Ben Nathanson, uh, who's joining us today. Uh, and uh, Prostate Cancer Foundation, anything there? Anything on that front? Not, not, not really. Um, so still some more work to do. Um, I, you know, there, I think there are a few people from ANCAN that, that are on here, uh, but uh, no, not, nothing else in terms of attracting patients. Okay. I have Thanks. a very good connection to Prostate Cancer Foundation. So if it, it helps anything with, uh, especially with the chief scientific officer, um, if the team would like, I can invite them for, for, the, for the next meeting or where, whatever would help here. Um, I'm more than happy to, to do so. That, that's always helpful. Um, uh, Brian has actually had uh, conversations with uh, Chuck's, 
Chuck Ryan, Howard Chuck. Sewell, and Gina Carithers. Uh, Brian, why don't you just update us on, on those? But we, we, but we, but I, I would ask you to do that uh, to make your con just sort of reinforce things and and. Uh, so do do proceed, but we do have some context there, Brian. What's how would you characterize it? Yeah, so so um, I've had various conversations with Howard Sewell over the course of the past year and a half or so. My um, medical oncologist, Raina McKay, um, essentially made the introduction to him, and he and I, he and I have talked about a number of different things. Um, he's always gracious and and taking my call, uh, which is wonderful. And then more recently, I did get connected with Gina Carithers, who is the CEO and founder, or she's the founder of Euro Today, which is now owned by PCF. Spent about an hour and a half with her, um, talking a little bit about the Prostate Cancer Lab uh, and other things. And then she actually made an introduction to Chuck Ryan. Uh, Chuck is the CEO of the Prostate Cancer Foundation. And again, his time was incredibly gracious, uh, about 90 minutes or so. And uh, we talked about everything from the prostate cancer uh, lab, this initiative, to PCF 3.0, which is the new uh, mission for uh, the Prostate Cancer Foundation, uh, and a variety of different things. So uh, they're engaged. Um, I do plan to reconnect with them uh, in mid-April and give them an update on where we are. And um, they seem to be open uh, to helping us. Uh, and so that's a, it's just a great relationship that we're building with PCF. And, and just, just to underline our value proposition to them is to give them a patient leg to their heavily research oriented leg that they fund a lot of research. Many of the leading prostate cancer researchers they're funding and then they have their conventions and their get togethers conferences where they share that experience. But uh, Brian's really uh, trying to get involved with them and bringing a patient perspective to what they're already doing. Yeah, so they organize every year a scientific retreat. Uh, is a three days that all the uh, top uh, prostate cancer researchers are together. I've attended in the last six years or so. This, uh, this is a fantastic meeting. And uh, uh, they spend 82% of the money they raise on, on research. Um, so yeah, I'm, you know, I'm happy to, to join you, Brian, or include because I have a very good relationship with both with Chuck Ryan and Howard So. Oh, fantastic. You know, I, I'm going to take you up on that. So yeah, um, yeah maybe there's a way we can do something in tandem. I, I would love that. Deal. Okay. And Brian, you, you went to the, the three-day uh, virtual research consortium meeting, whatever it was, yeah, yeah, like a, yeah. a couple of months ago? Yeah, exactly. Uh, so it was in October and uh, it was three weeks. Um, and, and yeah, I took copious notes and um, did some work offline uh, regarding themes that I saw. And that was part of my conversation with Chuck Ryan was, um, there's a lot of great science that's happening uh, that the PCF funds, but I think that there are opportunities for uh, ways of bringing it together and putting the patient in the middle of that. And I, I walked him through some, some past uh, experiences that I had in the uh, technology world as a, a marketing professional, building personalized experiences uh, in e-commerce and other channels. Um, so any, anyway, we had a very productive conversation. We certainly talked about the about PCF 3.0, which came out of those three weeks. And um, there's, a, there's a lot of opportunity. I, I would also say that Gina Carruthers is very interested in bringing the patient's voice um, to, uh, you know, to light in Euro today. Um, and that is a, a primary focus. The other thing is that um, Howard, I'm sorry, Chuck recognizes that medical oncologists really need to get smarter about how to even translate uh, you know, DNA reports, uh, much less RNA. And you know, here we are, we're about ready to get into proteomics. And so he's really using Euro today as a way to help educate his constituents which are medical oncologists 
we use some of my DNA reports and our RNA reports. And he said, Brian, you'd be surprised at how many medocs wouldn't be able to interpret this information. So he's got some work to do um, to raise the water level uh, of understanding and interpretation. And, um, and maybe there's an opportunity for the patient's voice to be part of that educational process. And the scientific report, the summary scientific report of the, those meetings, usually three days, but because of the pandemic, it was spread in, in a couple of weeks, was just released two or three weeks ago. So I can send you, Brian, if you don't have it. Um, it is always a very great summary, the state of art, what's happening in the, in the prostate cancer research. I did get on that. I, th I think um, Howard, I'm on Howard Sewell's distribution list. So maybe I'm, maybe I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so that was attracting patients and, and engaging with the large patient advocacy groups in prostate cancer. The next uh, subject area in the next step in the process is um, all the diagnostic tests. We call it gather data. And this is where uh, Rick, Rick Stanton is uh, our, our leader. Um, in the, recent, in the last week, uh, we added Lucent's. Uh, they volunteered to do a blood box biopsy for um, Brian and run his test. Um, and uh, we've also had, uh, we, we're continuing to have conversations with uh, TGen about um, being able to use the research use only protocol that they developed and expanding it so that uh, we can use it for clinical use for other patients besides Rick, <laughs> who's, who managed to get it for himself. So Rick, why don't you update us on the, the whole uh, area of all these novel tests we're trying to get access to and, and, uh, and apply in your cases. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I, I had a chemo infusion yesterday and I had a rough night last night. So uh sorry i'm just getting myself up um by rough night i just had trouble sleeping so um you know darn and then uh for me just as a quick update on a chemo cycle of three weeks um i tend to not feel so good right after i get the dose of toxel, which i got yesterday and then uh as the three, after a week, I start to feel better. Um, so at uh, the, day, the day before I got uh, my chemo or I uh, convinced, well, Sunday, I convinced myself that I was feeling Superman and uh, I got on my mountain bike and I, you know, I'm trying to exercise and uh, I, I pulled my hamstring on my mountain bike going up the wall which is pretty challenging even for me 20 years ago, but I determined mind over matter. And um, so I'm in so much pain for my leg, not, not anything related to cancer that I just absolutely couldn't sleep. And it was just like, ah. So anyway, uh, just thought I'd mention that. Um, and then from a patient perspective, and then I'll dive into the diagnostics. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting my... Uh, um, PSA reading today, I got the chemo and they do a blood draw. So I'll find out how my control is doing. I started getting that neuropathy in my hands and I'm a guitarist. So that's a, that's a thing that I don't want to see get worse. So uh, I had my uh, chemo lowered by 20% yesterday. Um, so hopefully I still get control. Okay. So um, my time with chemo is going to be coming to an end. It either just ended yesterday or I'll squeeze a few more weeks. My, I was on round six. So uh, the 10 is as far as they hope to go, somewhere between six and 10. So this brings up the uh, tests that Brad mentioned. Okay, so what do I go on next? Um, and that's where the tests come in. Uh, otherwise, I am going to be funneled. Uh, I'm already at the end of, uh, you know, and I'll, I'll say NCCN guidelines, although there's a funneling back and, you know, there's uh, different therapies I haven't seen, but uh, all my care team, uh, which is amazing, uh, led by uh, City of Hope, Tanya Dorf. Uh, Raina McKay down at UC San Diego and uh, Sandy Liu at UCLA 
who is running, I'm on an Arcus clinical trial. So what do I do next? So they're all open for, uh, uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, Rick. Uh, it's a local wall. I'm, I live in, in um, between Los Angeles and Santa Barbara. And uh, there's a mountain bike trails. I live seven miles from the beach and mountain bike trails to the beach. And it's just like a really steep. Uh, I mean, it's so steep that mountain bikers call it the wall. So anyway, uh, actually not really that many people could go up it without stopping. Uh, and I proved that that was a really stupid idea. <laughs> um, so, so what tests? Um, so I've had RNA seek done on my primary tumor. Uh, and I've been pushing for spatial because I'm electrical engineers. And I used to do earth observing satellites. I know how to segment images and look for tumors and uh, just was uh, very aware of uh, how much value that would bring to the table beyond uh, bulk RNA-seq. So, uh, but that's really hard to get into right now. So just to elaborate on it, uh, the tests that I'm hoping to have performed that will guide my next treatment, which is, you know, pretty much the reason uh, that's the, the first reason for this hackathon is what is our next treatment, you know, and, and what is the strategy? Wouldn't it be great if we could get, okay, I'm going to do this treatment. And when that, you know, runs and hits a threshold, I'm going to go on this treatment and I got a plan. So that's what, uh, I felt was lacking when I failed darlutamide, which is, an, you know, next generation, uh, uh, and uh, androgen receptor blocker. Um, and I, I didn't even respond that well, but, you know, okay, should I go on a clinical trial? Should I go, there's a thousand clinical trials sitting around 25 uh, molecular targets. Well, which one? And I, I was not proactive. And that was probably the worst feeling of my cancer journey is like, what do I do? And then finding out that none of my doctors really uh, put a lot of credence into any molecular evidence other than my CDK12 mutations. So they did pay attention to my mutations and knew, knew a little bit how to deal with it and use that mutation to guide um, suggested therapies at the bulk level, but they didn't interpret the RNA-seq um, and spatial is still coming on. Uh, so those are the diagnostic tests that uh, I'm hoping um, will inform. I'm lucky enough it to be uh, kind of, I'm an ex-bioinformatic scientist uh, of uh, sorts. I didn't grow up sequent, you know, that, that usually means that you analyze, um, you, you create and optimize DNA sequencing interpretation pipelines. And so I was at the tail end of that, you know, I interpreted not the mutations that was earlier in the pipeline. We had our team that was focused on, okay, when you sequence, what are the actual mutations that you can clearly identify? And then which of those mutations, you know, we, we did a germline somatic comparison, subtract the germline. So now these are the, they're called somatic mutations. They're the mutations that are particular to the cancer that are identified from that some traction and so okay now here's uh you know this list uh with, eh, typically a thousand uh mut mutations or so uh of that a thousand which are meaningful and so we'd run it through our uh pipeline and uh compare it against known cancer drivers and um so that is what i i've got uh identified as my my basically my one mutation and I know Brian's got like um, uh, TP53 and uh, a couple others, but you, you identify, okay, these are the common mutations that are associated with uh, cancer. And, uh, you know, for me, uh, just knowing a CDK12, that's, I have a dual um, and that's guiding my treatment at the molecular level and nothing else. So, uh, when you get to immunotherapy, you're 
really need to understand the tumor microenvironment and the immune signaling in that environment. And that's where these tests come in and the value of spatial. So you can identify neighborhoods of uh, you know, immune cells and how they're situated next to your tumor cells. Are you, if you can answer a basic question, do you have T cells, CD8 in particular, infiltrating your tumor, um, you have a better chance of uh, responding to immunotherapy. The reason I'm getting so long-winded here, and I'll stop in a second, is we want to, we want to identify, uh, do we have, they're called TILs, tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in your uh, tumor, so that they can be activated by the immunotherapy. And if you have a cold tumor, which means you don't have any um, tills in your uh, adjacent to your tumor that can perform the kill, it's a lot harder for immunotherapies to work because immunotherapies unleash that um, T cell uh, to uh, uh, enable it to kill the tumor. And if you don't have any there, uh, you have to maybe do a prerequisite that'll get uh, the, the T cells in proximity to the tumor. So that's where the spatial analysis comes in uh, and will help direct care. So that right. is- well, the, Yeah, the what's, what's the timing on all that? So I think you've laid out the case. You're yep. looking for those tests to give guidance and because you're at that phase break and you're gonna need that information to inform your treatment strategy. When do you think you'll be able to get that from uh, that kind of spatial analysis, proteomic, single cell, that, that, that you know, sort of above and beyond testing? Uh, I'm still pushing on it. And um, there's two vendors that uh, I'm pursuing currently. Uh, that's Nanostring, the GeoMX platform, and Akoya. Uh, both are exquisite, both are cutting edge, and unfortunately, both are uh, research use only. So uh, they're hesitant, these companies are hesitant to perform a test and reveal the results to a patient because um, they're just, it's a goal of theirs to become mainstream, but they are not currently clinically approved. So... TGen is nice. Uh, I used to be pals with Nick Shork, or I, I am pals with Nick Shork and some of the bioinformatics scientists that I worked with at Human Longevity are now um, at TGen. And they were nice enough to put together a protocol that would uh, allow research use only. But uh, from a patient perspective, this is going very slowly. Uh, at City of Hope, they do have the instrumentation. They have my tissue for my primary tumor. And just getting that seems to be, that analysis run seems to be ever elusive. So I'm hoping in the next, so your question, when? I'm just trying to get the trigger pulled on, you know, slicing my tumor, uh, my primary tumor, I'm putting it in the instrument and that seems to be needing some type of legal yeah uh, so um, i have this protocol let's let's uh brian why don't you speak to uh, it seems like saul priceman could be uh a, we have two breaks to the log jam one is um nick shork and tgen providing a protocol it's irb approved that would allow this research use only testing to be given to a patient the other is to work in the system with your clinician, let them order the test and let them be the one getting the information. And Saul Priceman could be part of that and, and City of Hope. Uh, Brian, why don't you speak to that? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll talk um, about the relationship um, that we're building with Saul Priceman. Um, and then I think I wanna come back a little bit to Akoya and then talk a little bit about um, liquid biopsies. And I think some really interesting things that are happening on several different fronts. So I think the way I would characterize the past week for me is really um, just fortunate in, in getting ingrained in a number of different things. But starting off with Saul Priceman, Saul Priceman, he runs the Priceman Lab at the City of Hope. Um, I would probably characterize him as maybe 
the brains behind um, the amazing work that City of Hope is doing around uh, CAR T um, cell, uh, uh, sorry, uh, CAR T therapy and, and CAR NK. Um, in any event, um, we have developed a, a wonderful friendship. And he is introducing me to, actually, I met somebody a long time ago, was, uh, Peter Kuhn. Peter Kuhn is the CEO of Epic Sciences, but he also has his own lab. Um, and apparently, he is doing some cutting edge liquid biopsy work that can uh, get down to, um, you know, looking at transcriptomics and even proteomics. So um, that was sort of the 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 um, the tagline for a conversation that we're going to have on Friday, and he sent over a few papers. Um, so we sort of need to get under the hood of this, but if in fact he can get down to you know a protein level using liquid biopsy, and there are also some potentially some other specimens, not tissue though, it's it's, it's outside of tissue that would be um, potentially a game changer. So um, so we're talking to him, or we will be talking to him. Peter Kuhn, uh, uh, just sorry, Peter Kuhn has a lot of research done on a single cell um, and that was published as well. He's very famous about uh, doing all these assessments. Um, and, and I think it's important to to, to connect with him. He's, he, he was a couple of years ago, uh, ago far ahead on this, uh, this all omics diagnostics in, uh, based on single cell. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. Um, uh, he, you know, um, I, I think I, um, I'm, I'm getting to know Saul pretty well. He's pretty well regarded. Um, and uh, I, I gotta tell you, he's been such a, an incredible um, champion um, to support uh, me and, and this initiative and Rick um, and Brad and, and also another patient, Bryce Olson. So um, we're very fortunate to have him in our corner. And so I think where Brad wanted to go is, is because I'm also uh, being treated at City of Hope, Tanya Dorf just established a relationship with her uh, last week. Um, we could potentially, um, you know, leverage Saul uh, to, uh, to potentially, you know, get some of these, some of Peter's uh, the testing done through the City of Hope channel. Um, so that's, uh, that's, that's something that we're going to be working on and uh, something that I'm uh, excited about. Um, the other thing, just real quick, um, through this effort, uh, Lucent's uh, reached out to me to do a liquid biopsy. It's, uh, it's a, um, it's a, uh, just a, uh, cell-free DNA um, uh, tests. I'm going to do that, which is you know super easy. I'll give blood all day long. It's like no 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 problem there. Um, on the tissue front, uh, I have I have my primary uh, tumor from 2016. I have my met tumor from 2020. Um, I know that my met tumor is it's fresh frozen. I'm I'm assuming that my primary is, but I don't know, and so I'm trying to find that out. And I'm also trying to work with my medical oncologist, uh, Raina McKay, to, uh, to basically get access to that tissue so that I can run the spatial phenotyping that Rick was talking about earlier. Um, I was also fortunate last week, Akoya Biosciences was here in San Diego and uh, they had a, a conference. And so I went to, to go get educated I think I was the only marketer in the room other than the Akoya Biosciences marketers. So <laughs> I was a little bit out of my, out of my element, but uh, I did, I did learn a lot and, you know, I, I, I know enough to be dangerous. Their platform is evolving very, very quickly. Um, they can already do test 80 anti. anti 80 antibodies simultaneously. And I think that they're, you know, they're really almost at like at hundred anti antibodies uh, right now. Um, they can cover immune profiling, advanced lymphocytes, myeloid uh, immune uh, activation, 
uh, structural um, metabolism, stress, and death. Anyway, just a number of different um, uh, categories. And so the other thing is, is that um, they are installing these machines at UCSD, I don't have a time frame in terms of when they will be available. Um, they're currently just um, getting them engineered and set up at UCSD, which is great because obviously that's going to fit into the protocols. You know where where you know my primary medical oncologist is, uh, so I, I will be leveraging that. And then the other thing I would say is um, there is a. A doctor from Cedar Sinai, his name was uh, Zhao Zhang Chu, and he is building organoids, not using cancerous tissues, tissue, but healthy tissue, to build organoids. And he's wow. using Akoya's spatial phenotyping um, to better understand how these organoids actually work. So, you know, um, it's it's really interesting because. We know that tissue is the scarce resource in this diagnostic you know, adventure that we're going on. And if there's a way to use organoids or you know, uh, blood as what we're, you know, we're going down the path with, um, with, uh, with, with Peter Kuhn, um, those could be really game changers in terms of our ability to have uh, much more accessible and much more powerful diagnostics, which is what we're trying to get into the clinical conversation rather than just conversations about various treatments. Um, I want to know what's happening with my cancer. And so these are really exciting, um, really exciting developments. One other thing about Akoya, um, because I, I recognize that tissue is the limiting factor. I spoke to Dr. Oliver uh, Braubach, who is the head of applications at Akoya, about whether or not they've ever used blood um, in, you know, you know, to put them through their um, assays. And he did say that they have done um, whole blood, PBMC, peripheral blood mononuclear cells. Um, said it's a little tricky because it, it, um, it smears, um, but this is something that they are also looking at. Um, the smearing thing for me, like, is just a, a, a layman. I was just like, freeze it. Like, can you do something to figure that out? Um, but anyway, that's uh, obviously uh, too too obvious of a of an answer. But um, you know, I, I'm just sharing this because, um, as, as you all know, you know, the the pace of of development is, is so fast, and they are a great uh, case in point for that. Glenn, you have a question. What, what is the what is the possibility of you know fresh uh, tissue, fresh, unadulterated uh, tissue. Yeah, you mentioned you biopsies from your existing Mets, Brian. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about that. So, um, yeah, I was just talking to uh, Raina about that, just to email chat. She's a little hesitant. So I have, um, Glenn, I have um, three Met tumors uh, currently in my peritoneum. Um, the largest was about, I think, two centimeters. I also have caking as well. So, you know, they're not going to go and they're not going to do surgery because I've just got like microscopic. Right. So, um, and no she was, primary. uh, my primary is gone. So my prostate is, is gone. So, uh, no. uh, but, but we still have that available. Uh, I just need to find out the form factor if it's FFPE or if it's fresh frozen. So if you had, uh, the ability to, uh, to get, you know, a a, a new biopsy and enough tissue. You, you mentioned organoids, something I'm very um, interested in. You're talking about with the, the healthy tissue. Why not, you know, grow the microscopic, you know, Brian's prostate organoid uh, with the actual um, tumor tissue from from the Met site through S Engine Paris test. Have you looked yeah. at that? Yeah. Yes, uh, I spoke to uh, Carla about two or three weeks ago. That's and Carla Grandori, for those who don't know. Yeah, Carla Grandori. Uh, so yes, I spoke to her, and um, so that is a possibility. Um, the challenge that I, I have right now is that, I think good news, bad news, is that I'm responding to abiraterone, and so my tumors are likely shrinking. And so there's a question of, you know, whether or not it makes sense to go in and do a biopsy. Yeah. Um, so I would love, you know, any opinion on that. Uh, so 
Rainer McKay was kind of open to it, but uh, didn't see, just, she typically would do a biopsy on a tumor that is in a growth um, pattern yeah. as opposed and to- And then you would, need a, you would need a washout period depending on the agents that you're on before you could, you know, they would wanna handle that tissue. Yeah, yeah. agree. Uh, but yes, um, so with S Engine and their organoid, they would need uh, they need fresh. They need actually they yeah. need they need live. Overnight. They need Overnight. live fresh frozen. Yeah, which is yes. different than fresh frozen. So I'm, I'm learning a little bit more about pathology than I yes. than I ever thought. But um, so that's a possibility. It just means that I, I need to determine whether or not. Uh, uh, I can actually get get the biopsy. And just two, two things, uh, Heather Messerly dropped off, she's with Certus, and we learned in one of our previous hackathons that the quality of the tissue is really important. That like when they try to create mouse models, they're only successful about 40% of the time. So it's, it's, it's very important, not only that there's tissue of added quantity, but quality and all that handling is, it, it's, it's pretty, pretty dicey and, and sometimes doesn't work even so. It is. I just went through this process with S Engine with a family member a few weeks ago, and um, you know, at the at the at the primary, uh, and there was enough tissue, but for whatever reason, it just wouldn't take. wouldn't It wouldn't. It wouldn't grow. And we're still hopeful that it will, but we're already a few weeks into the process. I want to uh, cue John Powers, John, if you don't mind my putting you on the spot. John is uh, also in the San Diego area. Um, also, he, he's the CEO of a company, SimpleSeq, that also is involved in this area of doing multiple tests and working with tissue. Uh, John, do you have any comments on the previous conversation? Again, I don't. I hope you don't mind my putting you on the spot. And if you're there, <laughs> you're on mute if you're speaking. Ah, I guess he may not. He he may have walked away. All right. So, anyway, that, that's. For for a future conversation, SimpleSeq is pretty interesting uh, as a, as a startup in the in the area that we should uh, also talk about in this area. Um, in the uh, I had a I had a comment uh, okay. because actually TGen is trying to organize uh, well via TGen. Uh, I haven't brought this up. They're trying to organize an organoid um, study, uh, and Glenn, uh, it uh, I I have. Um, multiple metastases from in, at the nodal re, uh, level. Um, and UC San Diego, uh, Raina McKay's pathology team said that they could biopsy it. But uh, when I uh, started on a clinical trial run out of UCLA, they said it was um, too hard to get to and too small, and they can't. So I had directly differing opinions. Now I'm coming off of uh, chemotherapy and um, Dr. Dorf uh, recommended a uh, bispecific uh, PD-1, CTLA-4, and olibarab, uh, olabarib, if I'm saying that right, which uh, uh, has mm, been a, approved to um, CDK-12, but then as after that approval is a little uh, less compelling of a single agent drug, but she said, yeah, that's true, but uh, in tandem with the CTLA-4 uh, Zencore's uh, clinical trial, that that would be her recommendation. The reason I'm giving you this background is uh, a pre prerequisite to get on that clinical trial is uh, sequencing a metastases. So they've got to, you know, I have UC San Diego saying we can get it, the pathology team, UCLA saying we can't. And so now, uh, Dr. Dorf's team of pathologists is going to look at uh, can they get a biopsy, which would qualify me for my next treatment as recommended by Tanya Dorf. So I'm hopeful as part of that um, biopsy is the organoid study. Uh, as part of this precious biopsy from a, a nodal, which is not that large, um, you know, one half centimeter by one centimeter roughly, could we get enough? tissue to sequence, to do an IHC. And by sequencing, I mean DNA and RNA-seq at the bulk level. 
Um, do we have enough to do spatial analysis uh, for nanostring and Akoya platforms and do organoid studies? So there's a, uh, I, I need to, I don't think organoids studies need much uh, tissue, but I don't know. So that, that's yeah, my understanding. I don't, I don't know what their minimal specifications are as far as the volume of tissue and that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, so, Rick, let, let me let me move on. I'm just uh, sensitive. I want to get around the wheel. And, yes, and thanks. Oh, out. gosh. Thanks. Uh, yeah. So uh, and I just for those who don't know, Glenn is uh, a hero of mine because he uh, He's an integrative expert, integrative medicine expert, and wrote the book N of One about his own journey um, through uh, um, kind of a, uh, what do they call it, miraculous responders uh, uh, in uh, getting uh, his CLL under control without, uh, without typical medicines. Um, so um, I also want to introduce uh, Lynn, uh, Laura, if, you do, if, you're, if you're not eating your lunch, <laughs> As we move on to the next section, we want to talk about analysis and treatment options. And, and you work at Reboot RX, and maybe you could tell us about Reboot RX and whether we. we I don't think you're on our um, poster. You probably should be. Um, but can you introduce Reboot RX and uh, tell us about what your contribution could be to uh, the, the cases? Oh, and she may have stepped away as well. No, there she comes. I'm here, right. I'm here. There we are. Okay, good. <laughs> I have to multitask at the same time, though. Right, sure, um, sure. Yeah, I I am not quite sure how we can help, so that's why I'm you know trying to listen in and and stay as engaged as I can in the meantime. But happy to tell you a bit about what we do at Reboot RX. So we are a nonprofit startup, and our goal is to get affordable treatments to patients faster using repurposed generic drugs. Um, and we're developing AI technology to be able to sift through a lot of data on generic drugs to be able to systematically prioritize repurposing opportunities. And in collaboration with Brian, who really inspired our first deep dive, we selected prostate cancer for our first cancer type that we would focus on. And we've been working on that together since mid of last year um, and engaged with a few of you here. So it's good to see you. Um, and we've, so what we did with that project was we sifted through all of the PubMed studies that mention any of the 1000 non-cancer generic drugs and prostate cancer, which is around almost 17,000 publications. And we ran them through our technology to be able to identify the relevant studies, which what we mean by that are studies where non-cancer generic drugs have been tested for the treatment of prostate cancer with clinically relevant outcomes that were reported. And so we've identified more than 80 non-cancer generics that have been tested in a clinical setting for prostate cancer and then developed a scoring algorithm to be able to inter basically integrate all of the data across these clinical studies and rank the generic drugs with the most promise. So we've identified some promising candidates and are in the process of moving them forward. But our goal is not necessarily to promote any off-label use of the drugs right now. Our goal is to gather the definitive evidence so that we can be confident that they're both safe and effective for treating their new indications, in this case, prostate cancer. So while many of these have been tested in clinical trials, including randomized controlled clinical trials like phase two trials, for the most part, there isn't that definitive phase three evidence yet. Happy to go into more detail, but hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're working on. Are you working on small molecules largely? We are looking across all drugs that are FDA or drug products that are FDA approved that have gone off patent and are not approved for or commonly used to treat any cancer type and are available as generics. So anything that falls in that category. So that modality would typically be small molecules is my question. Yep, some of them. Yep. But is there any... any molecular evidence? Sorry, uh, I used to do high throughput screening at Amgen and, and counter screening, and I ran those platforms to a so a little bit of a question. Um, is there any? Is your AI matching anything specific to a patient to your uh, small molecules? 
Do you mean any molecular characterization? Yeah, like a, a mutation, an RNA seq, anything that would be not population driven. Like we know all yeah. cancer, uh, you know, prostate cancer patients tend to be this, and that is how my therapy is being determined now. But um, I think part of our testing is to know that well, you know, Brian's cancer is different from my cancer, so his his your your platform might pick out a different therapy. Is that true? Is Do you use anything that's different between Brian and I? At this point where we started was just analyzing the published literature. And in most cases, there aren't specific subpopulations that are molecularly driven in which the drugs have already been studied. So that's where we're gathering the data currently. We're also adding on additional data types at this point, but it's still early days. But the goal is to get to that point. I would think on top of your AI, so you have these thousand drugs, or you have many drugs, 17,000, I mean, you know, a large virtual pool of, uh, I'll say, um, molecular structures that you're uh, trying to determine might be a best fit uh, from using your AI platform. Uh, and so my question is, I mean, I would think what I would want to do is uh, we've, we've talked about organoids. So the idea is to grow up a, uh, a colony of, of prostate cancer, a prostate cancer organoid from some small seed cell. Okay, we got the seed cell, we got the tumor uh, fresh. Now we're growing a, a colony of uh, a tumor, a tumor colony, uh, you know, in a Petri dish. And then your platform will come up with, well, I think there's these prioritized list from our prediction of these seven uh, small molecules that will, you know, uh, pipette into uh, uh, different clones of the, this organoid and see what, what arrests the cancer. Is that your vision? Like, uh, is that how you would use your platform? It could be used in that way in the future. We're not at that point right now. Okay. And I just got started. <laughs> Are you planning or do you have any access to data sources? Because uh, these drugs uh, uh, probably were used in, in the clinical setting. So any electronic health records to look into that, whether they were used and that would complement the phase two studies or only the published evidence and to, uh, to, to, to collect and, uh, and structure all the available evidence. I know FDA, even FDA is open with uh, generic drugs that are used off-label to, uh, to add new indications based on uh, uh, real-world patient data. Yes, that's what we're doing now. Yep, early days still, but yes. Um, I saw, just quickly, Laura, I saw um, Saeed Sayad, I think is his name from Rutgers. Um, on the Shirley Pepke hackathon, which I'm helping on, uh, where he did a similar analysis um, of a, I don't know, again, existing drugs. Are you acquainted with his work? The name sounds familiar, but if you could send me that paper, that'd be great. Yeah, I will, I will uh, I'll send you his, his contact information and, the, and also the analysis that he did. I probably have that somewhere as well. Thanks. Um, okay, again, in the interest of time, um, let's move on to the last section um, which is the clinical area. And Brian, I think you have some updates on clinicians you've spoken to. You mentioned uh, Peter Kuhn, uh, Saul Priceman. I think you spoke with Michael Morris at uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering. Any, any kind of updates on the state of uh, engaging more clinicians? Oh, and, and you and I spoke to Mario Galusic uh, this past week, so yeah. Yeah, so I think we covered, you know, Peter and Saul. Um, I did speak to Michael Morris last week about this endeavor. Um, he is engaged. He wants to stay engaged. Um, obviously, he's got a, you know, he's got a big job at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Um, uh, he 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 encouraged us to think about um, pursuing this from potentially a grant perspective. Um, where we could use a, the grant structure to um, engage more clinicians uh, in a way that 
is familiar with them. You know, so for example, you know, my Dr. Raina McKay is, you know, going as well as uh, Tanya Dorf uh, are going after an initiative. I think I mentioned it last week called Promise. Um, it's, you know, it's a, I think it's a PCF grant. So that's kind of the, the way that, that they work. And um, he suggested that, that we think about, you know, how we would want to approach that. Uh, so I haven't taken any steps since then on that advice, but um, he's certainly somebody who uh, we can speak to about this and he'd be happy to help us if, if that's the direction that we wanna go. Okay, so in just a general request, we're looking for many more cl clinicians to participate. If you know anyone, uh, I'm looking at you, Susana, uh, in particular, uh, that we might uh, invite to uh, review things. So we're, we're working with them individually to make it as easy as possible. We know they're all frightfully busy and we're having conversations with about how they can work with us. Maybe just a quick email occasionally to give us some guidance. So try to make it as easy as possible, but engage as many clinicians as possible. Um, so that pretty much has us uh, wrapping, uh, going around the circle. Uh, there are a couple questions that Rick has put in the chat. I'd like to ask Rick Davis to uh, uh, share those. We can cover them live. So, you know, we've gotten 55 minutes into this, and I, I feel like we're just chasing our tails here. I mean, I have to say, I mean, this is very re rewarding for the scientists. But I come to this from the perspective of what can we do for the patients right away? Um, notwithstanding, they need to be thinking down the road, we, but that point was made last week. I mean, there was a huge um, sea change, if you like, in terms of approvals last week with Pluvicto. And I know that if I was Brian um, or Rick, what I would be doing right now rather than looking at all these um exotic strategies is to get my name onto a uh wait list as soon as the lutetium 177 psma uh, 617 which um has now been commercially retitled Pluvicto, and don't ask me to give you the generic name. Um, I'd have to get it up on the screen to, to do that. Vipapetide Vipap something or other, I, I don't know. Um, I mean, here's what we know. Both of you guys are PSMA avid. We know that from your, your, your scans. We also know that this treatment is very effective. Um, was it effective for Bryce? Not as much as it could have been, but then he went with actinium, he went with a lower dose. And if I were Bryce right now, I'd be doing the same thing. I mean, we had a guy who didn't do well on three doses, three high level doses of lutetium, and they put him onto six doses. They, they, they switched him to a different trial and he responded with the lower dose six, uh, of six cycles, which is what's been approved. So I would love to see both of you guys on that. I mean, we can come back to this and we can continue doing this, but we need to do something for you now. Now, where can you get this drug? We're not sure because all the managed access trials have been closed. That was a condition of the FDA approval. So we, we're not really sure who, um, has the hospital approvals in place to deliver this on a market basis. We think that UCLA does, which would be appropriate to both you guys. That would be the closest, we think. We don't know. Calais will, if you get hold of Calais, he's going to tell you if he can deliver it market. From a price standpoint, a, um, Advanced Accelerator Applications has made arrangements until Medicare covered. Um, to subsidize. And in your cases, since you may not have Medicare, I'm not sure if you have a SSDI or not, and if you've been on it long enough, um, that would be applicable to both of you. So AAA is well aware that this doesn't cover everybody and their patient connect program has a telephone number in there. And if you don't get anywhere, call us 
and we'll put the strong arm on AAA and say, you're not doing enough for guys, for younger guys who need it. But I cannot urge you enough to refocus your efforts over the next week to get yourself to get yourself into a program which will deliver lutetium um, 177 PSMA 617 to you. And is that so, Pluvicto? Is that what? Pluvicto is the name. So the website, I'll put it in. They actually have a website that they've set up, <clears throat> um, pluvicto.com. Um, and that's, like I say, that's the, that's the commercial name. I mean, that's what everybody's calling it now because it's, it's easier to say than anything else. Um, I, was and, just, oh, I was told yesterday by my oncologist that it is available in Seattle at SCCA as well. It, is it available now on a market basis? That's helpful. Uh, it, that's very helpful. Um, I believe if, so. I mean, you have to be castration resistant, but, which I am not. But uh, yeah, it's it's available. Okay. It's, it's since September, they've had it available. Yeah, but that's not the same. What do you See, mean? here's the issue. They've had it available in managed access in some of these sites. In trials? So we know several sites where it's been, evo it's been available in managed access trials. The problem is that those hospitals may not have approved to deliver it to outside of the trial. So Hopkins, for example, last week um, gave uh, Herb Geller, one of our board members, he got his first um, application. He just snuck in under the wire, and so they'll continue. But Hopkins is not going to deliver it to the public for several months because they don't have the approvals in place. Mm. So, yeah, so there's a difference between being able to deliver it right now, which several hospitals we know can do, and being able to deliver it to the public as an FDA approved drug. And that's where we don't know, not e I mean, not even AAA is aware. They said to me, they think that um, UCLA, Chicago, University of Chicago, uh, Mount Sinai, and Tulane, Sartor. So again, you know, get, you, you guys have a relationship with Oliver Sartor. Call him up and say, are you delivering on a market basis? If you are, get your gu get, get you guys, get your name on there. So you have to fly to, to Tulane. It's a lot closer than Australia. And, and, nice and so you have to Orleans. fly to uh, New Orleans once every six weeks, you know? Yeah. Um, but that's what we don't know yet. We we know it. It can be delivered, and we know it's being delivered in managed access. We just don't know who who is which hospitals are approved to deliver it to the public yet, and that's their own internal approval. So, Rick, do you know what the best outcomes have been?